Kierkegaard says, if you begin loving and you stop loving, you were never loving to begin with. Unlike the fact that you had a million dollars and you were a millionaire, that is true. But if you stop loving, once you start loving, if you stop it, you were never loving to begin with. He suffered a lot, Kierkegaard. It's like that kid, Phil, who comes in and says, I'm now becoming aware that I'm not aware. Something happens. You have an experience of something so different that you say, oh my God, this is something different. This is not quite the same. And that, and that moment of difference is awakening to something else. And there's a peace. There, 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 there seems to be, seems to be with, with these experiences, these deep experiences of deep intimacy or a deep communion or deep, there's usually some, there are usually some universal um, characteristics. Peace is one of them. Uh, naturally, one becomes disinterested. I mean, you become, uh, your ego no longer is very interested in grabbing. It's, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a sense of grasp, non-graspingness that's there. I, I mean, so I only can talk around this because it, it's, you can't talk about something that, that it, it's an experience that, that when you see it, you know it. You feel it. And it does change. Um, and that's where I think the deep conversations is something I, I find my students when they come and speak with me they say things like I don't talk like this with anyone else and I'm not sure what that if that's a compliment or a uh, fear because for some to speak that deep or to share the longing is very frightening. And I think the deep silence is too. Because it's a vulnerability there to the point where we have no more moorings of the, of, of the familiar. And boy do I, as I'm even saying this, I can feel my wanting the familiar to be familiar. It's the battle of the of wanting to just be in control and the deep silence and the deep longing and the deep conversation, the deep speaking ultimately ends up in a silence. A silence. And one author once said, it ends up in a silence, a wordlessness, a thoughtlessness, a consciousnessness and a laughter that we ever had to talk about it to begin with. <laughs> but it is transforming, and I'm finding more people looking for this because they're, they're wanting, they're, they're so much, there's so much pain. So it's the paradox of the oneness and the threeness, which is this wonderful sense of, of, of I, I think you get that in human relations. I think the closest we get that is into relationships that are committed covenantal relations, where people in those relations say, I I no longer live for myself, but for you. Let me just say this. For Christians, therefore, the love experience is what God is. We say God is love. But the word is agapic, agape. And we see these, the words, the covenantal words, and you see them paradigmatically in the marriage vow. Huh? For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Basically what it means is the covenanting experience of love is, no matter what happens, I say yes to you. Yes. No matter what happens, 
My ego will no longer be of any interest to me subjectively, but, the, but becoming one with you in this communion of love, in this covenant, that's where my treasure lies. In dying, before I die, in the school of loving another. Uh, the contract, as I understand contract, is a legal binding um, mechanism by which conditions are met on both sides and expectations are satisfied. So you scratch mine, I scratch yours. Uh, we have contractual lawyers that read the fine print because uh, you don't sign a contract without um, knowing what you're signing because you want to know the conditions by which you, you will give and which you will take. And if you sign a contract without knowing that, you're an idiot. On, an, on the other hand, this covenant that we get from the Ju Judaic world, the, the covenanting the, the, of, of, the Ju of, the, of God in the, in the Hebrew, the Jewish scriptures, and even the covenanting that we see then in Jesus, who takes that tradition and simply enriches it with his own understanding of it. Covenanting is um, something that you do not knowing what you're doing when you do it, but you do it anyway because of love. Now, that's the key word, love. That I can covenant in a relationship. See, this is, this is I think, essential for Christianity. Because for Christianity, at least from the Roman Catholic perspective, no one is saved privately. We are not saved we are not brought to the fullness of consciousness alone. It's a communal event. So there's, uh, therefore, there's no such thing as an individual Christian. That's an oxymoron. Contradiction in terms. It's always about relationality because the divine is imaged as the relationality, the divine relationality, the Trinity. Therefore, all human consciousness evolves itself to this place where the network of of love is a profound communion of, of saints, we say. I, I think that the practice of disidentifying has been the process, the journey of, of going through, through, that, through those practices like meditational practices or through the ritual practices. Because this Eucharist, this Eucharist that we do here is to really to accelerate this kind of communion with Christ, a communion, but a communion in, in the Roman Catholic theology, we, get, we can have a communion but never lose quite the separate identity in the communion. There's still always. But then there's these mystical traditions that bore, even at Meister Eckhart, some of these mystics are, they border on saying, oh, but the communion is so communing that there is no more I and you. You know, there's, there's, there's it's this. The, but it's the divine we which is the Trinity. You know, it's this communion of the we, which is, uh, which is still, there's three, we, we say the mystery of the Trinity, there's, you know, you can't say more than a sentence without becoming heretical, some, some <laughs> writers have said. But the Trinity is this image of God, which is one God, but three distinct, unique persons in such a profound community that they are one. It's a communion of saints, we say. So a covenant you get into, not knowing what you get into when you're getting into it, but you get into it anyway, and then what are you? Still a fool, but a fool for love. Yeah, I think so. I think that's part of that covenanting, as opposed to the contracting. And most of our relationships are contractual. As long as you give me the special feeling, then I'm with you. Without the special feeling, then forget it. There's a wonderful book on Mary Magdalene and Jesus by a woman named Cynthia Bougeot. And she has a formula that we use at DePaul, because this is another course I teach. I teach a course on esotericism and the occult and Christian mysticism, right? And we use her book. And she has a formula. She has A equals E times K. When that means agape, love. This love that allows us to make these con unconditional covenants. 
I say yes to you, no matter what, I'll work this out with you. And when you get two people doing that together, then you have the experience of Christ. Because you have two dead people now alive in a communion of saints. And then if that went on to three people and five and ten, and imagine the whole world living no longer for the egoic self but for the other, the covenant, she says A, agape, equals E, eros. The erotic, the passionate that so oftentimes gets tangled with the egoic. Me, my pleasure, my satisfaction, my ecstasies. <laughs> the egoic. To take the erotic, but to multiply it by what she calls the K or the kenotic, the kenosis, which is what St. Paul says is what Jesus did. Though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but he emptied himself. The word there is kenosis. He emptied himself becoming the form of a slave. Hmm. A servant. If you wish to be the greatest, you become the least. You become a servant, as I have washed your feet. Now you wash the feet of each other. And that becomes your greatest erotic pleasure. Your greatest eros is to be of service to others in kenosis. Imagine that. Your greatest eros, your greatest erotic pleasure is to die in service to others. And that, she claims, is what agape is. Because agape is not the, you know, the, the special feeling that you get, you know, in, this, in, the, in the romanticism of our culture. <laughs> you know, which is like an 18th century invention, this romanticism, and you have to have special feelings. And if, you, if the special feelings die, then I don't love you anymore, and, and all of this, you know, that kind of stuff. Special feelings. But this is not that at all. That's egoic. But when consciousness expands to, the, to this place of, of non-grasping, then it seems naturally we find ourselves in the agapic covenant making where we find our greatest passion in emptying ourselves for the sake of others and our great joy in washing each other's feet, each other's feet, and outdoing ourselves, St. Paul says, outdoing yourselves in charity you know, in love, doing yourselves. 